Today, organizations spend more on public communication than any stage in history. Uh, just as an example, um, advertising expenditure passed $500 billion in 2015, and despite some recession in that sector, is forecast to increase to $600 billion in two, by 2018. Public relations, as most of us know, is growing by 10 to 11 percent a year in developed markets and up to 20 percent a year in uh, fast developing countries. Yet in the, in, the past few, in, in the past few years, developed Western countries where investment in public communication is the greatest have seen a collapse in public trust in major institutions, in government, in business, and even in the non-profit sector. And also, at the same time, landmark uprisings um, against major institutions uh, and, and rising public sentiment against uh, the promotion, the persuasion campaigns of organizations that traditionally uh, claim to serve, represent, or even govern them. Um, and of course, uh, prominent among these has been Brexit, the UK referendum vote to leave the European Union after 40 years of membership, uh, and of course, the election of uh, your esteemed president. Um, but there are also other manifestations <laughs> of this that I will refer to. Specifically, the analysis will draw on three, draws on three areas of my research over recent years. First of all, I always draw on my sort of fairly extensive work in the area of evaluation. And to me, evaluation uh, has been talked about today already, but it's a really interesting vantage point uh, from which to observe public communication. Um, because um, evaluation models identify the objectives and the strategic intent of communication, the activities undertaken, and the outcomes and impact achieved. So whatever we might normatively uh, advocate in theory, measurement and evaluation is where we see what organizations actually do to whom for what purpose. Um, as Tom Peters says, measurement, uh, what gets measured gets done. Uh, in the past three years, I've served on the Evaluation Council of the UK government, which spends around half a billion pounds on public communication. I've worked closely with AMIC, with the IPR, Task Force on Evaluation Standards, um, I've been involved with the European Commission, uh, Director General of Communication and Development of Evaluation. I've conducted evaluation of a number of uh, campaigns in my own country. And I've just finished writing a book um, on evaluation called Evaluating Public Communication, which I looked at a number of sectors uh, across the field. The second area that I'll look at is uh, the use of social media for corporate and political communication. Allegedly, channels that foster two-way interactive engagement. Um, and I'll draw there uh, very broadly from three studies that I've been involved with that are reported in the, the 21st century media revolution that I wrote a couple of years ago. And the third area, of course, is my most recent work, the Organizational Listening Project, which is an ongoing project um, that so far has closely examined the public communication and engagement of 48 organizations in four countries, exploring basically how and how well they listen to their stakeholders and their publics, and compared with how well we speak. The detailed findings of stage one of this research, uh, which included corporations, government and non-government, has been published in a research report that's available online, a 2016 book, Organizational Listening, The Missing Essential in public communication. And the findings of stage two have just been published recently uh, because they focus specifically on government communication in the UK, where I was based last year studying government communication pre, during, and post Brexit, which was very, very interesting. So drawing on this body of research, the following analysis is really an attempt to, uh, to bring some context to these and other events. Are they, are they isolated events that are happening, or is there a common pattern perhaps emerging? Are they just politics? Um, or is, are there broader implications? And in the context of today, what has this got to do with public relations and other professionals engaged in public communication, or what is sometimes increasingly seems to be called strategic communication? The 2017 Edelman Trust Barometer that we're probably all familiar with shows that 41, only 41% 41 of people in, uh, trust their national government and slightly more than half trust business uh, and NGOs. And the most alarming thing is that public trust in all institutions is in decline over the past decade. 
in uh, just last month in an address to the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., Richard Edelman uh, declared that the new battleground is trust. Now, academic research confirms this collapse of trust, especially young, among young people. Um, in the US, for example, a 2015 Harvard University study found that less than one third of 18 to 29 year olds trust the president. That was President Obama. 14% um, of Americans trust Congress, 12% trust Wall Street, and 11% trust traditional media. Uh, trust in the European Commission has fallen from over 50% as recently as 2007 to just over 36% in 2016. In summary, two-thirds, and think of this, two-thirds of 500 million European citizens do not trust their regional government and the mechanism that has bound Europe together and maintained stability since the horrors of two world wars. I find that fairly worrying. Now, there's und undoubtedly many reasons for this decline of trust, but professional communicators and communication researchers <coughs> need to do two things, in my view. First, we need to recognise that in an environment of low trust, the future, future public communication in business, in government, and in other types of organisations is not going to be effective. Rebuilding trust is a prerequisite for effective communication. Secondly, and perhaps more controversially, I'm saying that if we're honest with ourselves, we need to ask whether public communication had a hand in the loss of citizens' trust. And I'll try and speak and justify that questioning as I go through. Gaining public trust, um, well, given, sorry, given the falling public trust, it should be no surprise, although it has been to many, that we're seeing landmark outpourings of public frustration and outrage. The June uh, 2016 referendum of, by vote by UK citizens to leave the European Union, referred to as Brexit, was contrary to the strong recommendation and very confident campaigning of the government and of almost all major opinion polls. The Donald Trump election was, uh, Donald Trump was regarded as unelectable by almost all post pollsters, almost all, and political pundits, and his election shocked the world, even us down in Australia. <laughs> and these are not the only, uh, only recent uh, political events worthy of note. Just 18 months before, a referendum in the UK saw 44.7% of, of Scottish citizens vote to leave the, Europe, vote to leave the UK. Just one year after the shock Brexit vote, the new British Prime Minister, Theresa May, took the UK to a general election with predictions of a huge majority, up to 100 seats. The UK government emerged with a hung parliament after a massive swing against it. Australia, one of the most stable democracies for more than a century, had five prime ministers in six years between 2010 and 2015 and entered 2017 with the national government holding power by just one seat. Lovely photo of my hometown. <laughs> Professor of Political Communication at the University of Leeds, a colleague Stephen Coleman, refers to these events as the insurgence of the unheard. And I'll return to that theme in, in a moment. The public communication related to these and other recent events and developments have led political commentators and philosophers to make a number of quite alarming announcements about our society. In September, 2016, The Economist declared that the world would enter the era of post-truth politics. By year-end, Oxford Dictionary, Dictionaries announced post-truth as its word of the year. In an academic analysis, Jason Harson argues that post-truth is more than a simple disregard of facts and reliance on emotional appeals by politicians. He refers to a regime of post-truth. Harson says a, a convergent set of developments have created the condition of a post-truth society. And in that he names the fragmentation of media and the loss of gatekeepers, the growth of professionalized PR and spin, algorithms that governs what appears in media and search engine rankings, internet practices such as clickbait and bots, as well as other developments. UK political scientist Colin Crouch describes the current state of politics and government in major Western countries as post-democracy. In his book, Coping with Post-Democracy, Crouch says, while we have elections and they continue to exist and we can change governments, public electoral debate is a tightly controlled spectacle managed by rival teams of professionals expert in the techniques of persuasion and considering a small range of issues selected by them. 
Some argue that the collapse of trust in major in institutions has gone beyond post-democracy and post-representation to an era of post-politics per se. Some even go further and warn that the world is becoming post-society. <laughs> 